All right, you ready? ready? I'm ready. Ready, Jersey. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Little SpongeBob thing. Yeah, uh, I so watch that show. Mm-mm. What's that? I still haven't watched uh, SpongeBob. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I don't even know you. <laughs> you know, it's this thing. I, I guess. Um, yeah, I put it all into uh, stuff like the Lean Into Art podcast, and you know, getting my, uh, you know, working on the the new ver- um, story arc in my comic and stuff, and other creative projects. So, yeah, too much to do to to watch TV. Although it is on Netflix streaming, I highly recommend the first couple seasons uh, as as a bedtime thing. Although it's gonna you're gonna be laughing so hard you won't sleep. Uh, anyway, yes, lean into art. The the lean into art cast where we encapsulate some of the things that we think about in terms of visual storytelling, um, delivering information visually, and uh, stuff that uh, you know, ideas that go into our <laughs> SpongeBob, <laughs> the ideas that go into uh, the the workshops that we lead at Lean Into Art, the Learning Network. So uh, that yeah, that guy that that, that, that hasn't watched SpongeBob, uh, but we'll forgive him. His name is Rob Stenzinger of Interactive-Storyteller.com. Hey Rob. Hey Jersey, Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com. ComicsAreGreat.com. Too many darn sites. That's and that's the place where you can find everything I do. Heck, you. Uh, You've got your your various web presences you're maintaining for your your comics. Would you outline your strategy on recent uh, Thunder Punch Daily? Right, your your podcast oh, you got you got rolling again. Um, n- you know, not that. I mean, po- Jersey getting a podcast rolling. It's not like you need yet another one. But I dig Thunder <laughs> Punch Daily because it's it's just you know it's just you and we get to sort of hear more behind the scenes things about what you're working on and stuff. It's fun. Yeah, another another layer was just added to that actually as uh, opening discussion. Um, I realized I, I've been doing. I started instituting warm up sketches back into my day again, which I did a lot in 2010 and 2011. But it kind of uh, fell into the, the background uh, at the end of 2011 because of all the stuff we were doing at Lean Into Art and all the teaching stuff I do. Um, but with this whole, we we did an episode not too long ago about task management, and the whole emergent task planner, and all that stuff. Uh, one of the things that helped me do was reorganize my day so that I can fit in more drawing. And so I fit in this 20-minute warm-up sketch, started doing those, and I realized that uh, I had been posting them on my blog at comicsaregreat.com slash blog. But I thought, you know, now that I'm getting sugary cereals up and running again, they probably should run there because Comics Are Great is sort of like the catch-all of everything I'm doing, my teaching work, my advocacy work, leading to art, everything that I do. Uh, but... Sugary Cereals is going to be where my new comics are going to start updating soon. Uh, so shouldn't any art-related art blog stuff go there? And I went through that whole existential crisis of, oh, man, am I really going to like reorganize this again, figuring out where all the stuff is going to go? <laughs> uh, but isn't that part of what makes web publishing so awesome is that you can shift your gears around as much as you like to, you know, I'm running it on a Tumblr today, but I may move it to my blog tomorrow, you know? Absolutely. There's uh, uh I mean, it's really powerful when we're making the, this uh, different content that we put on the web text and maybe it's formatted text where you've got bold things and headers and bullet points and you've got images, uh, videos, audio. Uh, it's cool how you can have, um, you know, have it sitting somewhere and then maybe uh, mirror it or rehost it or you just have a lot of flexibility. You create these resources, then they're not trapped if mm-hmm. um, if they're in a good kind of home. Um, some places where you try to put resources can be more trapping and, you know, less, uh, uh, you're less able to reshare from, but... Um, but not everywhere. I mean, so places like uh, um, Google Plus and Facebook are, are more of a, a destination. They don't want you sort of just saying uploading videos and hosting them everywhere. But then again, like YouTube is totally great with that. Um, mm-hmm. Or like you post things on um, a WordPress blog and piece of cake to post to your Tumblr or vice versa. So, right. Pretty yep. cool. 
No, it's yeah, that, that was at the tail end of that Thunder Punch Daily where I talked about my my uh, strategy for sharing content on multiple platforms. Uh, let's see, what episode of Thunder Punch Daily was that? One episode 144, I want to say. Uh, so that'd be at comicsaregreat.com slash TPD144, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to log into my site real quick just to make sure that it is indeed what I thought it was. Um, oh, for crying out loud. Yeah, episode 144, Back on Track was the name of the episode. But at the tail end, I talked about how, like, with something like Posturous, it's, like, it's absurdly easy to share in, just blast it to every place where there, where you need to have a presence. Mm-hmm. And I get asked this all the time in my workshops, like, geez, you're everywhere, Jersey. How do I, how do you keep up with that? Well, with Posturous, it's just, like, boom, push it to my blogger, push it to my Tumblr, push it to my uh, Twitter, even my Facebook page, so... Automate, yes. I know that this is something that is near and dear to your heart, Rob. Yeah. Um, and in fact, as in, in part of the, um, uh, what do we, we call it, the Creative Topic Variety Pack, one of our workshops that we do, uh, there is a, well, it, it's a series of uh, what were labs, but but what we did with these labs during 30 classes in 30 days is we, we did sort of, um, it's almost like a proving ground of, of presentations or things that we were still honing. Maybe they'll become like new versions of, of full up workshops. But we, um, I don't know, you know, I'm really proud of what we made. So honestly, looking back at it, we could have just called them all workshops. But um, yeah. but part of the premise was to get more of the audience interaction all the way through and uh, for people to bring up new challenges they were facing during the, the month and whatnot. So um Anyway, it filled a couple of roles, but they're really good. And um, you know, if I do say so myself, uh, the uh, um, and then one of them is, is on um, introduction to art automation. Yep. Which, uh, yeah. Awesome session. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's at that's at uh, lean leanintoart.com/workshops where you can find the creative topics variety pack. Eleven hours. Eleven hours of content there. That is crazy. You, know, you can spend a whole day. Yeah, exactly. Yep, eleven hours of content. Um, I know, like I'll play around. I'll check it out. On, uh, you can. We have a few different versions you can download where you've got the the full resolution FLV video, uh, which a lot of um, applications will let you just download and run that normally on your um, on your machine. You don't need Flash or anything to run an FLV video. Um, mm-hmm. And since that's native to what Adobe Connect does, a lot of times we do share that version uh, when we record it there. Um, mm-hmm. We also have the uh, you know mobile-friendly, watch it on a tab- tablet-friendly MP4 file, uh, and then we also include uh, um, MP3s for most workshops too. Yep. So when you're doing the dishes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so. Didn't expect to mention that, but yeah, we should mention that every once in a while because that is, um, you know, it, 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 we're putting money into this thing. It, it costs our time and our money to make this show and to uh, run the learning network. So in, in lieu of getting sponsors to say, um, you know, this show brought to you by Paul Palmolive. <laughs> Ask for it by name. Uh, instead, we're going to say, hey, this show is brought to you by leanintoart.com slash workshops, uh, where... The, by availing yourself of the sponsorship, you're also getting more in-depth content than the, what we talk about uh, on these shows. So, are we ready to kick into talking about uh, CSS, this mysterious thing, these casta- cascading style sheets? Yeah, um, we are ready. Because, Rob, I, I got a question for you. Yeah. I could just go, I was talking about po- uh, Posturus a second ago, I was talking about Tumblr. Dude, I just started a Tumblr and I made it red. Done. My web presence is complete. Look, I put my Twitter widget in the sidebar. Done. I don't need to worry about the CSS stuff. That's for nerds. That's for, you, you listening to you listen to the hypercritical podcast, right? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Uh, John Syracuse said that not everybody wants to be a programmer, right? Not everybody can be a programmer. And, and as a matter of fact, I, I was talking with another friend who listens to those shows, and they said, "Boy, I listened to that episode, and it sounded like he said only the gifted, privileged few." Uh, can can monkey with this stuff. And I've talked to other cartoonists about this CSS stuff, modifying CSS and doing customized websites. And they say, oh man, I look at that and it just looks like a bunch of garbly gook. It's it's only for people who like math who want to read that stuff. I mean, uh, you know, uh, 
PHP files, uh, managing my H1, H2 tags, uh, sure. figuring out where these di different div containers are going to go. Buh, forget it. No, I'm done. I want to just make a comic. So why, why, Rob, are you beleaguering me with this stupid, <laughs> nerdy, working with CSS stuff? I have a really bleak outlook on life, and I want you to have a tough time. <laughs> I, want, I want to share the pain. So, join you SOB. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, uh, let's see. I think there's some validity in the idea that, well, uh, you know, programming is different than visual art, right? Pr um, let's see. It's hard, tough to write while I was um, uh, talking, but so programming is different. But at the same time, we are being intentional communicators in both situations. It's just that. The, the details of what's at hand varies. And us being familiar, so those details become part of our vocabulary, so we feel comfortable with it and we can express things in it. That's when we, well, okay, so we've put a lot of time into becoming visual artists, and so we get the idea that, well, um, it, we can practice things like line value to convey a lot of different things about uh, the world a character is standing in as far as, you know, are they wet? Is it, uh, um, is it an intense scene? Is, are they moving fast? Or, I mean, we get a vocabulary for things that a lot of people who are casual to uh, visual art, would look, they would look at it. Maybe they would benefit from it. Maybe they would get it on some subtle level, but is it language that they have a grasp on that they could also then now go express things on their own? Probably not. You went through some kind of effort to get that ability and I would argue that, well, that same kind of effort, you could do that with programming as well. For better or for worse, you have people who represent the, the, that space. There are people who are artists that aren't that welcoming to new artists. And there's programmers who aren't that welcoming to new programmers, especially if you're not kind of uh, fitting in a certain culture that they want to you know, welcome, a subset of. Yeah. So I don't know. I really disagree with John Syracuse as far as that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you, if, if you want to say, well, can anyone, should anyone go program a bank system and or um, the, the insides of a pacemaker? No. <laughs> That's very specialized. You need to build up to a certain set of capabilities and, and have um, a background for that. But... Boy, there's a big difference between some of those systems that are life or death and have big risk attached to them and your style on Tumblr, which, <laughs> you know, you can, uh, I'm saying, you're, you, let's see, the risk is low and it's a good place to play and, and, and pick up um, another way to express yourself. Here's, here's, here's something I would throw in on top of this is like, I, I do a lot of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and use the word coaching. I'm going to use the word coaching because I know this is, a, this is a sticky button for you, Rob, is that you know coaching gets a bad term yeah. or it gets a bad rap, right? Because there's so many carpetbaggers out there who call themselves life coaches. But, you know, coaching, there's a reason we have coaches in sports and in, you know, they're there for guidance and, and whatnot. So, so I coach some of my former students who go off to college or like students who have are in college and they're like, they come back to me and they're like, how do I start up a freelance career? Because they're not finding this out in school. <laughs> they're not being taught this in school. And I'm like, what? Uh, but uh, so I say to them, I was like, okay, well, you know, I go through some A, B's and C's. And then I say, and, and what are you going to do for insurance? And they're like, what insurance? I'm like, yeah, if you're a freelance, you don't have insurance. Uh, what are you doing for taxes? Are, are you going to be putting aside money to pay your taxes quarterly? They're like, what? I got to do that? I'm like, yeah, the, the client is not going to deduct your taxes for you. You have to deduct your taxes, right? And so I go through all this stuff with them. And then they go, there's always this moment where they go, oh, you know, this is, this is more work than I thought it was going to be. And I go, and they're like, uh, hey, I just wanted to draw for a living. I'm like, yeah, but, you know. It's also a business. You have to treat it like a business. And and I watch them slowly start to come to grips with that, and they accept that this is a, a hurdle they have to learn in order to run a business for themselves, right? Exactly. Is this not the same thing? 
is this not the same thing? Like understanding at least a little bit of, of fundamentals of, I'm not going to profess to be a CSS guru, but I can open up a CSS editor now and go, oh, okay, this is the section where they're defining all the styles, which you're going to talk about here. Here's where you define the styles of the way links look and the way links interact and behave. Here's how the size of an H1 you know, uh, line of text. Here's where, whether this is going to be... Uh, an inline container, or um, I forget what the other kind of container is, right? Um, sure, block. Yeah, inline. A block container, right? Um, this is how. This is where I can modify the padding and the margins on these different containers, um, in order to make this thing look very unique and idiosyncratic, so that people come there and they know they're going to get a very unique experience. It's not just going to look like a 2003 WordPress installation or a just a standard tumble log with, uh, you know, your own custom avatar in there. Um, exactly. I mean, it's less of a... Uh, I, I think in the, later in the presentation, I call it uh, you're styling or you're defaulting, right? Uh, yeah. There you go. So, whoops. I didn't mean to jump ahead on you, Rob. I just I was trying to come up with a justification before anybody runs out of the room and says CSS. I thought this was leaning to art. Well, this is part of the back end oh, of. Man. There's so many yeah. things that are hybrids too, where there's a lot of uh, uh, technologies and conversations where you've got artists, people who would label themselves as an artist, and you people who would label label themselves as more of a programmer, working side by side, and sometimes you run into people who label themselves as both. Um, which I fall into that category, um, yeah. and not ashamed to to admit it or what have you. I mean, the um, yeah, Flash may be not as popular as it once was, but go to a Flash conference and you will see lots of folks like that, lots. Mm. And it's uh, okay. it's it's neat. <laughs> but uh, uh, so explain what we're looking at here. Okay, so what we're looking at is uh, this is sort of of saying, well, what if your um uh why why do i care about css you know i've got um you know i i don't want to to monkey with it this is this is saying like like well you probably are using some css no matter what and it's giving control over how things are getting laid out look at this we've got a three column layout we've got a certain font in the header we've got uh, this this separate styled subheader with a certain alignment and all this stuff these fancy tabs and all of a sudden we look at what it looks like without, this is just dumping the CSS, same document, same web page, same URL, all that, whatever. But And suddenly we're in 1997. Yeah, and this is, you know, exactly back to the future uh, web style. Um, <laughs> and uh, oh. <laughs> here, we, here we go with, you know, really like all the same font and, uh, you know, very, very default looking things as far as uh, you know the bullet points look at how they look here this the the, the empty circle and here they're they're the um, they're a separate square you can control all these things how if you and if you're a visual artist you probably care about how things look visually um, and this is a way where you can now um, incorporate your uh, your vision and your ideas in in effect your web presence and what's cool, we're going to delve into um, some practical things, um, like look, sort of a what if you have uh, a web page on uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe you're using uh, WordPress, or maybe you're using Squarespace, or TypePad, type pad, you know, something where uh, we're just going to kind of jump in and uh, do some view source right away. But um, the uh, sort of, here's the flow of what we're going to talk about is uh, we're going to play. We're just going to go to a web page, leanintowork.com, and play and explore. And then we're going to look, think about what we saw for a little bit, and then we're going to go and change uh, one of my Tumblr sites based on what we awesome. yeah, learned. So what do you think of that, Jersey? I love it. Let's hit it. This is going to be like a little mini class. Yeah. I know it's funny because uh, in, in the uh, intro, we were talking how, about how... Um, maybe uh, our uh, podcasts don't, don't go as in-depth on topics. And I think, uh, well, we're really straddling the line on this one. <laughs> uh, this is pretty well, 
a workshop. We could go into a whole thing about how this is not uh, interactive. You know, the difference is that the classes, people can actually be participating live and asking questions, whereas right now we're just broadcasting. So this is more of a presentation, not a class. Exactly. Um, Although I'm, I'm here to act on behalf of the, uh, the person who's like, CSS. But okay, so cool. you got leanintoart.com open. Yep. And I'm going to just view the source of the web page. Every single page you go to on the web could be teaching you this stuff. Um, good news, bad news, different pages look more organized or less organized. So um, we care. What is this? What is this robot talk that you just put on my screen? <laughs> <laughs> this is HTML. And uh, what we care about today is, uh, so we care about the CSS. So like, okay, I may open up something like this. I may look up uh, CSS. Okay, cool. I see a couple of places where that's coming in. What's neat, so like I'm in Google Chrome right now. And I think this works in Firefox as well when you do the view source. Uh, stuff that is sort of um, linked to the web page. And we'll, we'll explain this more in a, in a bit. But... Um, I just want to emphasize, like, go to any web page, right-click, view source, and then swim. <laughs> and and yep. see, see what you see, because this is all we're playing with. There's no, like, extra um, magic craziness or, or subtle uh, secret, like, high-techy, you know, geek programming in a movie commands, whatever. It's just, I pulled up a web page, leanintoart.com. I viewed the source. We got HTML. There's a lot of stuff here that, yeah, somehow if I scroll through this, I mean, wow, that's a whole bunch of, you know, I recognize text and I may notice like some of the things that are on the page. Um, but yeah, that's, this is just a big old text document. There's some things that like you run into some files like image formats. Thankfully, we have a lot of programs that can open up image formats, no big deal. And there's, they're, there's just something more open and welcoming in a way where if this is text, it may look like weird text and unfamiliar, but it can become uh, familiar because it is uh, plain. Anyway, and if we want to explore more for the th other plain things that are linked in, like CSS, um, well, we just can click on it. So I know like for Lean Tour, we care about this common CSS thing. And uh, because we happened to have made this site and whatnot, uh, so I know which is the important one. But if I didn't know which is the important one, I could click on them all and start going, oh, okay, this doesn't seem to be describing that much. Because what's neat is that that um, I see this, this kind of stuff. And between the slash and asterisk, um, I'll just share this with you. These are comments in CSS. So all this this is is is, is uh, describing something. It's not doing any work, right? This is all just communicating to me. Stepping back, little secret, not secret. All code is communication. Yeah. All code is communication. Like if someone's you know programming um, um, the latest uh, whatever cool mobile game, Angry Birds, whatever. Whoever is making that code, if they want to, you know, go on vacation for a week and come back and whatever and remember what they were doing, chances are they're leaving comments in there. And chances are when you get used to reading this, you'll know what it's doing by reading it. And just like you can write a blog post that is clear and concise or verbose and wandering, yeah, code can be that way too. It follows our same kind of expressive quirks. So... Food for thought there. Um, anyway. So comments are a way for the author to make notation in there to say, that's this next block of stuff that we're looking at, it, if it's not immediately apparent what it does, here's what it's doing. So like you got a comment there that says slider. This is for the slider. Frame yeah. position. Fast nav forward and rewind. Description. Yeah. You know, uh, file yeah. name. And then, then, then I give this extra context. I'm like, what is this about? Oh, the slideshow. Okay, they're describing parts of the slideshow. Yeah. Cool. Oh, I guess I wasn't worried about the slideshow. Time to dive back in and swim around and find the thing I was curious about. 
and it kind of looks like this common CSS looks like it has more of the things that I'm caring about. And uh, we'll... more elements, image defaults, right? Yeah, exactly. Course Squarespace elements because we host our site on Squarespace. Mm -hmm. uh, image floating editor constructs. Well, that one's a little bit more obscure to me. Editor constructs. Yeah, because uh, it, it, Squarespace ba it lets you. Uh, when you log in as an administrator, you can change your site right on your site. So what we're going to look at here in a second is I'll pull up, um, we'll play with uh, the styles. I'm going to use a, an application called, um, oops, where did that thing go? Um, Espresso. Oops. <laughs> Too many things on my desk. Um, here we go. So here's the puzzle that some, um, we can look at this raw file, this CSS file, and we know that it helps style this HTML file. They're related. But how do, but you know, if we like to do things visually, how do you do that? Well, there are some tools available, um, such as the um, uh, tool by MacRabbit called Espresso, which is, which is sort of like Dreamweaver for CSS. Yeah, and it and a little more too. It's actually like a light version of Dreamweaver in a way, because you do have other programs like Dreamweaver. There's um, uh, let's see, we, I'm going to hop back to the presentation uh, because I have a slide on this. Um, let's see, do 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 do. I'm already way up in the presentation because of how I was jumping around. But how I take the blame for that. No problem. Visual editors. Uh, that's why I like using this Prezi thing, so we can jump around. All right, so visual editors. Uh, we're going to play with Espresso. But, of course, um, that does cost money, and so does Dreamweaver. But there's free options out there, like Ap Aptana Studio. That's more heavy-handed toward coding, right? You may get exposed to more... It's like if if, uh, if a developer opens Photoshop for the first time, there or do you remember opening Photoshop for the first time? Uh, you might have felt like a fish out of water. Like you may have expected, yeah. like there's this visual thing I'm going to, going going to go change. What are all these floating windows? Holy moly, layers! Yeah. What? And, and uh, but you get used to it. Yeah, you do. You know, I I teach. Uh, I just taught yesterday a Photoshop class at the Ann Arbor District Library and. Uh, even with Photoshop Elements, you know, the stripped down version, I was dealing with adults who had never used Photoshop before. And when I told them about how you have to keep your eye on the layers palette, the top uh, characteristics bar and the toolbar all at the same time while you're editing your stuff, it was like, what are you talking about? And I said, hey, have you ever used Microsoft Word? You know, they're like, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> to me, Microsoft Word looks like a nightmare of windows and menus and everything. So uh, it's something where we're used to this in our own particular apps that we are accustomed to. What you're pointing us at is that it's the same kind of thing. It is. And uh, let's see. Uh, um, oh, that's funny. Actually, I, I ended up preparing this on my other machine. So um, these uh, Firefox extensions, um, they are free. But uh, there, there's two of them that kind of work and do different parts of the problem, but even when they work together, they're not quite as smooth as something you would pay for, like Dreamweaver or Espresso, what, or what have you. Um, uh, Firebug and Edit CSS. Those are two free extensions that, that I would recommend you add. And you could start sort of um, uh, getting used to that idea of, of what they do. And what they do is let you uh, change right on the fly, live, and explore the the your your document. Um, so let's see. We're gonna go back to Espresso, and uh, we're gonna turn on this explore mode visually, right? So we can now check out any element on Leaning to Art by clicking on it, and we get it. We get this explanation here of of sort of what is it and how could it be styled, right? And and uh, we're, we're it, isn't the inspector box also give you a clue as to that too? The inspector tab at the very top right. Yep. Yes, it does. Um, and what it what that also does is it sort of 
gives you a, a really um, the brief summary of what you're looking at. Whereas up up yeah. in the top, it's more of the um, if the if you think of the document as sort of a tree of folders of all these things connecting together. Um, something when you start playing around with the idea of programming, well, well, actually, you you'll have this for sure in, in if you use um, like Flash or a library of of visual elements, or um, combined with layers, you can have nested layers. That's all that is basically. These are the nested layers of the document, and uh, up and up across the top. And in this uh, window, we we know the, the the direct thing that we could talk to with the style to affect it. So what I want to do is is um, just open up this as a spreadsheet, and I'll um, I'll bring this over, and uh, yeah, then we'll let's see. What are we gonna change? I think do 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 do. I think what I want to do is is uh, change image. So I'm gonna do do do. That's uh. This is a image selector, and we're going to delve into the parts of CSS in a minute here. But what I just did is I, I added a box shadow to image. So now every image on the site has a box shadow. And Exactly. And so now I'm going to uh, float it uh, right. So now it behaves different, too, as far as when it sits next to other elements uh it 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 caused a reflow of layout now css is a deep topic we might end up doing a series of podcasts on this based on your feedback from this one um this, this one is this this sh this show is going to be about um being playfully diving in and uh i think we'll we'll unearth something interesting even if you are very familiar but also um well we're going to Try to, to provide a, a safe place to dive in if you're not that familiar but you're curious. So that's, that's kind of yeah, the, our goal today. The cool thing with, with both the plugins you were talking about and uh, Espresso is it's letting you see what you're changing live, but it's not actually affecting your site unless you copy this or save this CSS file and upload it and override your uh, previous CSS file. Exactly. So, it's totally safe. Perfectly safe. So you could go to any site and start learning how they were doing things. Um, and then I'll sort of reveal this extra, this is one of the reasons why Espresso is worth its money, is that um, it's not just like how we did view source and we saw the CSS, right? Well, it also gives you sort of, uh, you know, Photoshop-like palettes to, to change things in the... Uh, um, uh, CSS without actually knowing the um, the fine detail there. So if we do, um, oh, let's see, if I go to image, uh, we can see like, for instance, float is already pressed in image. Now I could change that to float left and it switched it visually yep. and it changed it here too. So we can play with the, the visual tools, we can play with the code both. In, in in espresso, whereas the uh, the Firefox tools, it's not quite as all glued together as that. But anyway, um, I think we should jump in and, and start talking a little bit more about what we're looking at here. Like, uh, what do you think, Jersey? Like, what do I think about what? Uh, should we jump into um, explaining more about the the parts of CSS? Um, I, yeah, I think so. I think you've given us a sense of like how the tool works, so how we can be playful with it in a safe way. And like I think that like I, that you were saying, espresso with the Photoshop ish palettes is an invaluable part of it. This this application used to be called CSS Edit, and it was instrumental in me beginning to understand how CSS works. Um, it was uh, it was my heuristic way of I interacting with how CSS works. I still don't have a deep understanding of it, but I at least feel the confidence that I can open it up in this application and goof around with it to make things move around the way I want them to. Um, yeah, you can be so, familiar with it. You can even be effective with it and without being an expert with uh, tools like Espresso and Edit CSS and, and Firebug with that Edit CSS let you um, do something similar too. So it, it gives you a chance to learn it. Um, mm -hmm. 
let's see here. Uh, so yeah, let's let start uh, explaining to us what these different pieces are because it's still even though you were monkeying with the with uh, espresso, it still looked pretty alchemical watching Ooh. the different lines of text change. That's uh, that I'm being playful there too. Where uh, we just jumped in. I wanted to show you that it's safe. Go ahead, jump in. No one's going to get hurt, <laughs> even if it's just total gibberish at first. Um, there's ways where if depending on, I mean, heck, I mean, you may already have uh, certain tools like, like um, I think I picked up Espresso via a, um, like one of those Mac Heist bundles a couple years ago. And, oh, cool. Yeah. And, and I just, I had it on hand. Um, anyway, it's, it's interesting. Uh, and I didn't start using it, to, you know, for until like the last like six months or so. Um, so, yeah, um, a web. All right, stepping back, like we were chatting about in the beginning, a web page is this. Uh, let's see, it's it's it feels like one thing. It feels like yeah, this is like a word document or a PDF, and everything's here. Well, it's more like a um, let's see. You ever place files into Adobe Illustrator? You don't have to place them inside the file. They could be. Uh, references that are pointing to originals elsewhere. An HTML document it's a lot like that except you know it's an open standard where it's meant to be uh, welcoming to all kinds of content that's you know it's like oh I, I have this HTML and I'm pointing to some images and some some styles and some JavaScript and some video and boom they all form this one document and uh, you know for the most part Lean Into Art uh, shows a lot of those capabilities. Um, now, all, we're ca all we care about a lot today is CSS3, and uh, you know I'm happy based on uh, you know any any questions or that, or things that come up, discussions around this this uh, um, workshop or anything you want to bring up, Jersey. Like we can meander from there, but like mm -hmm. we really care about the idea that CSS3 cascading style sheets are this powerful visual thing that give you control over how that web page full of all those different things looks and um, we're gonna you know now now let's get a little bit deeper okay so how in the heck is a web page made of all this stuff well there's an open standard for how you're supposed to be able to take that and turn it into um, one document, which is basically, uh, ever, you hear this phrase, this uh, acronym thrown around called the DOM, and it's not like uh, the actor Dom DeLuise or, um, you know, your friend named Dom. It's it's document object model, and it it basically means uh, all that stuff is is loaded and live, and and it's stored in like kind of like how that, that layer hierarchy or folders, however you want to think of it, it's in a structure. Um, and it kind of looks, the, the DOM thinks of things in a way, or it keeps track of them in a way, like um, like this. So if we, if we look at one of the um, main navigation elements on Lean Into Art, the, uh, the blog link, well, that's inside a div, or actually that, that link is inside um, a list tag which is inside an unordered list group which is inside a div and uh, there's a couple more above this but uh, every single one of these things is, is is nested somewhere in this DOM which all that is is like the live idea of this document why do you care about the DOM you need to care about the DOM a little bit because that's how the browser sees your page that's it if you want to say hey guess what I, I have a style I want to use to affect the the banner. Just the banner, though. I don't want to affect every image on the page. Well, you'll need to care about the DOM to know how can you talk directly to the banner with your style. And that's all we do is we 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 need to keep in mind: uh, Do we want to control everything of a certain kind of element? Do we want to control one specific one? And if you have control over the HTML code, you could go in there and say, "Oh, you have this ID. You're the you're called ID page banner. 
Now I just go into my style and I, I refer to that. Or am I grouping everything? Maybe I have, uh, let's see, uh, workshop headings. Yeah, the workshop page has multiple workshops. Um, what if I had a class instead where I, that, got, that allows me to sort of give this ID to a lot of stuff? Or what, may, what you may be dealing with is like in your Tumblr blog or something that um, you have a lot of posts. So a lot of times post won't be one ID. It's going to be a whole grouping of things. So it's, it's a class. And then there's other stuff yeah. on top of it. You can get, way, you can get really fancy and, and super ninja cool with uh, uh, style sheet um, selectors with dealing with like the status. Are you hovering over it? Are you... Um, was it visited in all that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, it makes me think of in like the old days uh, where you would do like a rollover element, and if it was like a custom image, there would you'd have to have like the uh, on position, or rather like the the normal position, hover position, click position. There'd be three images there. Yep. Um, and I mean, and, and I'm going back to like 2002 when I was first learning this HTML junk. Uh, you would have a lot of like uh, defaults of like, well, we hover over it, it turns like purple and it's underlined. Mm -hmm. But now you can do like, you can even do things, uh, as I understand it, where you can have like, uh, when you hover over it, it'll softly glow or like a uh, slightly transparent yellow box will appear around it, right? You can like set like, okay, it'll be this color of yellow, but it'll be 50% opaque and it'll appear over the word when you hover exactly. over it, right? And then the, that's that's a really cool um, cool segue into um, whoops uh, no I'll stay back here sorry so you you're you're naming sort of two different uh, two parts uh, that we're concerned about you have you have the the situation of the element which that's what lets you target it right so this element when something is hovering right then you want to tell it a style. Right, and that would do the, the the yellow glow or the different things you were listing there. Right, so yeah, two parts. Whoops, the the the, the sort of the instruction that you want it, how you want to affect it. Right, and then the uh, this this uh, selector. Right, and we'll we'll uh, we'll get more into that in a, in a second. So anyway, yeah, two different parts. Um. So let's see. We use style rules, which we visited this already before. You know, you can do a ton of things to control your document with uh, CSS. That it may look rather plain and boring without it. And so you may like like we were just in a um, a CSS document that uh, you know for leanintoart.com, and there was all sorts of you know these kind of things in there. Um, and it looks kind of like gibberish, but together, this is what forms your, you know, you know, mystyle.css, right? Oops. And uh, that's it. That's it's it's just a document of these these kinds of commands. But then, as far as what they're made of, we have um, these uh, you know individual rules. And in an individual rule, it just has. Um, you know, some standard parts to it. So the big magical thing we talked about was a selector. That lets you connect to a type of element, right? So this, oh, um, and right now, this is talking to the whole body of the document. Um, and then what do I want to affect on this thing that I'm talking to? So now I, I this this links me to it, and then inside... I get to tell it what to do. Um, so, uh, so this is like like when you're talking about the body, you're talking about like the whole site, the site as a whole. So this isn't where you're going to be setting like page dimensions or um, you're really going to be dealing with like kind of thousand foot elements here, like exactly. the background color, what font, right? Yep. What I mean, color the fonts are going to be. You may want to add like a width, but a lot of um, depending on your approach to styling your document, you may want to sort of have something underneath body, but it's up to you. I mean, yeah, you could start controlling yeah. stuff like that here. You may say, um, I want my body to be, you know, 990 pixels. 
and you know that would be then the, the you know the next sort of declaration right so each one of these things that's sort of a whole I want to control the color okay inside that I've got a property I want to control and a value and that just makes up a declaration so so each rule set you know will be inside your so you may be controlling body you may be controlling your header ones right and you may be controlling your paragraphs or you may have something called um, uh, let's see article article uh, T's right and maybe you have more than one of those right so if, if it's a class you're going to use dot article T's and then um, put in your you know so maybe this is this has a uh, a bigger font size right so you would go font dash size and uh, let's say and we can get into this there's there's different uh, this is where we get into the the additional depths right so right now we see pixels for size here and you can also uh -huh. use um, yeah EM which is um, I believe just the size of the lowercase m or x or something in the uh, oh oh I did not know that See, yeah. now I'm learning something here so which is uh, relative to the font and relative you know so here people will use em when they're trying to do relative size versus specific size pixels um, things get deep just like they get deep when you're learning how to uh, get enough contrast in your in your um, in your designs to draw people's eyes to the, the the concepts or ideas you're trying to sell in a scene or in a series of panels or I mean you learn a lot of deep concerns as you're as you're um, pursuing your visual craft also that depth absolutely there's there's a lot of depth here too but can we just just yeah. real quick talk about syntax because yeah. that's something else that I'm noticing is that each uh, property and or rather each value is followed by a semicolon Yes. Uh, each property is followed by a colon, and each rule set is contained within opening and closing brackets. Is that yes. what those are called, or is those a different kind of bracket? Uh, I call them brackets. Yep. So open, close bracket, and then you've got the uh, right. Yeah, your selector, which could be selectors is, can get fancy, but you can be very basic. So it may just be like this is the type. Right, so we mentioned that selectors may have, um, you know, based on the type or based on the situation, uh, an element is in. So what we want to do is we're talking to an element in the DOM, right, or one or more elements, and uh, right, and so yeah, sy syntactical things. Uh, yep, you want to be concerned about um, putting your selector in there. Uh, open and closing brackets, and then every property is going to be basically what tells you that well, we did property one, property two, property three. The key that's separating them all is that end semicolon. This, yep. this tells the browser when it's reading that CSS that oh, okay, your this declaration is complete because it went you know you said something and then you ended it with the semicolon, and then you said something and then you ended it with semicolon. So, and then the something you're saying is the um, you know what property? Colon. If anybody's getting confused, yep. Oh yeah, property. Yeah, property colon value yeah. semicolon. Yeah. That's that. That's the syntax of that's the sentence structure of these declarations, right? Exactly. Um, the other thing is that I would say, you know, just if anybody's confused about like when you say selector, what the heck are you talking about here? Okay, body. What else? Um, just not limited to, but including things like sidebar. Uh, uh, the, the the main blog container, uh, which is sometimes called like, oh, I don't know, some t typical names that WordPress uses for like a blog container, like for your main feed container. Exactly. Header. It's, it's like... Footer. This stuff, so like what kind of element? This is standard, right? Mm -hmm. This is defined by the, the standards bodies that say this is what HTML is, right? So what kind of element? It's, you know, is it a, is it a div? Is it a body? Is it a is it an anchor tag or a link, right? Is it, etc. Um, and then you can give those divs classes to say div class header, div class uh, sidebar, right? Exactly. 
something where um, again a class is like that's like a way of grouping stuff where you know there's probably going to be more than one sidebar thing so like if all of each of these was called sidebar uh, as a class so it would it could it would be like a div and then class equals sidebar in the HTML and then or you could do individual ID which would be div ID equals sidebar one div ID equals sidebar two to make them behave in different ways exactly that's what I did on the com comics are great site where I have two different sidebars that are different widths and their behavior is similar but I wanted them to have some different properties exactly and so then it goes until um, then you do a closing div always do a closing div that's what, that's the number one way where I break my site is I, I'll be monkeying with the CSS I'll forget to close a div and all of a sudden why is only the header showing <laughs> yeah exactly and so that so we are playing around with you know mentioning HTML these are they're very intertwined because CSS is all about styling HTML but uh, mm -hmm. definitely wanted to you know emphasize the CSS more but um, um, it's important to know well what am I trying to control here and all that selector does is it, it's, it lets you talk to something in the DOM and then I'm asking for my own benefit as well yeah. as the audience's because that was something where class and individual ID was something that confused me. Yeah, and so um, in uh, and then in CSS, in order to talk to the um, in which we could jump into an editor here too, um, jump back over to uh, Espresso. So we see um, clear that that's a class, right? Template. Template errors. That's a funny. Um, yeah, I didn't make up that one. If we go toward the bottom of the document, you'll see more of the ones that um, that uh, Jersey or I made up, um, like toolbar. Right? There's more than one toolbar, like on the uh, workshops page. So I I made it a class. Right? So that's when you're talking to a class for uh, you know th via a selector. Well. You start with a period. Dot toolbar. It's just a syntax thing. You'll you'll have to instead of you know. In in some ways, it's nice that it's not that long, but in other ways, it it hides, and you just have to learn it as a quirk of like, well, what does dot mean again? It means class. Class toolbar. So wait a minute. There's something with the idea of toolbar. Well, I know someone who needs to clean up their HTML, Rob, <clears throat> but. <sighs> Um, but yeah, some things do have an ID of toolbar as well. So then if they have an ID of toolbar, then it's actually a, a little, um, Octothorpe or hash, wherever you will. And, uh, then, hey, wait a minute, this selector has more stuff on it. Well, this is doing that trick like we, like we saw in, um, in the Prezia here where, you know, the DOM is looking at all this stuff like this hierarchy of nested uh, layers or folders, right? Well, okay, so this is an H1 inside a div inside a div. That, that's, that's what this, uh, our prior podcast uh, header title right here, H1 inside a div inside a div. So what that means in Espresso, how we would talk to something like that is we would do, actually, um, it'd be something like, you know, div. Whoops, oops, oops. We wouldn't have to do the extra div because we can do div h1 and then start talking to it. Like um, font size is 100 pixels, and that didn't didn't take because I was guessing, right? And here's where you get to um, instead of guess the address or guess where it is in the DOM, you can just click on it and then find out. And right now, here's where this applied styles thing is telling me more about what, you know, how I can address it. So, or maybe I don't like any of these ways of addressing it because I think, oh, that's going to mess with this other thing. I could just do a new style. And um, interesting. So then if, 
then if, of course, the, that's where these visual tools save you some time and whatnot. So you, then you can say, I didn't know it could do that. That's super cool. So, right, there we go. So I just changed the font size to 100 pixels. So every character is 100 pixels tall. And so now every blog header will be 100 pixels tall. Yeah, so if we scroll down the page, yep, here you go. Sure looks important yep. when it's that huge. <laughs> you know, poor people who show up with their um, mobile device, but... <laughs> um, yeah, but that's that's part of the fun of jumping in and playing live. And again, to emphasize, like Jersey mentioned earlier, we didn't save this file back to the server. We're just previewing this lo uh, um, on our machine inside this this app. So no big deal. Like uh, we can play, and if, then if we do like it, for us, we need to go to Squarespace and then say, "Oh, okay, here's this CSS," and then put it in there. Um, yeah. But you know what? That's kind of similar. Not that we need to jump ahead quite now, yeah, but I think we're getting close to jumping into Tumblr. Uh, yep. Um, I want to make sure... Um, did, did you have any other questions as far as that, the selectors and stuff, Jersey? And the... No, that cleared up a lot for me. I mean, just the, 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 the big thing for me was uh, the difference between individual ID and, and class, and knowing those two things will make it easier for me to navigate through my CSS files and understand what I'm really messing with. And, and the big, that was a big uh, headline there with the whole adding new classes or not new classes, but new, um, new CSS declarations in there rather than just modifying what's, pre what's already existing. That is super cool. Yeah. It's really yeah. handy because, uh, and you can do this, um, without the fancy visual tools. All it takes is you, you end up doing, um, a little bit of hunting and pecking, right? Where you're just like, well, that's inside a div, inside a div, and then you take a guess, and then you see if it's mm -hmm. affecting the style yet, and then you, you know, continue to sort of trial and error your way through um, affecting that specific element. Um, where and and then yeah, the visual tools say do they they save a lot of time. Um, so I find and. I'll warn people too sometimes that when I'm when I'm monkeying with my sites, I'll uh, if I'm working with a pre-existing style sheet, you know, I'll, I I actually bought a style sheet from a site and then modified it to do what I wanted with it, and there was a div within 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 a div. And when you're looking through the code and trying to figure out, okay, where's the closing div for this particular div? Where's the closing div for this particular div? It gets pretty, you, I, you wind up doing this on your screen a lot. Uh, 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 you know, counting all the divs to know that, okay, all my divs are closed, you know. But, but then again, some text editors, like what you're showing us in this example, actually color code this stuff too. And uh, some of them do, uh, as I understand it, some kind of syntactical kind of checking for you to make sure that everything's closed. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're typing away in, um, let's see. like So if we go to Espresso and uh, we just sort of pick a um, an HTML document. Um, I, a, lot of my, uh, a lot of my research documents and whatnot. Um, like, actually, we're looking at something I posted on Art Geek Zoo yesterday because I'm working on a uh, um, sort of a, a, a set of widgets. Maybe it'll be one widget. Probably will become jQuery plugin for dealing with um, embedding comics. Mm. You know, stuff like that. Um, so if I go div, I, I mean, see, look at how this, this editor, it's like, I just start typing D and all of a sudden, it's like giving me this list of stuff where, if, like, what did I mean direct dir or div, right? And then I hit enter, mm -hmm. bam. And then the whole div fills in, you know, and it's even suggesting ID. When if I start typing class and hit tab, I mean, so it starts. It's it, auto completing for yeah, you, yeah. Lots of auto completing fanciness, which is very nice. So if we wanted to style very nice div, in um, in our CSS, we would, you know, in in the CSS editor, we would do, you know, Octothor, very nice div, um, mm -hmm. open bracket, fill in some stuff, close bracket, and there you go. Or yep. we could do dot test because we're talking to it via class. Anyway. Gotcha. Yep. So I guess a demo in, of a couple different things there, but. Um, but yeah, I'm ready to, to dive into Tumblr now. If you are. Okay, cool. Um, man, there's a lot of... Um, let's just flag this. Maybe we'll talk about it in the future. 
there is a ton of power in CSS selectors. Um, food for thought. Maybe we'll include a link in the show notes to uh, to something. I know, uh, yeah, a few good uh, good books out there on this, and we'll mention them too before we uh, hit the end. All right, so cool. Let me fly along here. Oh, yeah, we can come back to this. Let's jump. Oh, well, no, I, this is an interesting one, too. This was one of the ones when I was looking at the presentation before we recorded where I was like, okay, this needs some clarification because this is one of the areas where I get confused. It, Elements in the DOM are either inline or block. What does that mean? An expectation management slide that I wish I had been, like, I mean, I, I'm a geek where, like, yeah, I've been doing HTML since whatever, uh, 1994, right? Um, and clear was very primitive back then. And yes, I, I've made all sorts of bad things, websites that were uh, laid out via tables and, and single pixel GIFs and whatever, but we all did back then, so what? <laughs> um, and then eventually CSS started to you know come about. And there's a couple of things that I just didn't fully appreciate, and I wish I would have sooner. Um, it'll help your sanity when you're trying to lay stuff out and you're like, this stupid um, span isn't listening to me saying that it needs an ex a different top and left position. You know, like I'm trying to give it a specific position here. What the heck? Well, that's because it's, in an, it's an inline element. And then, um, you know, so is an anchor tag. So, so like this links. Um, so our... Um, uh, you know, so like, whereas a block, so it is like a div or a paragraph. The big difference is that positioning behavior, and then as you're looking at it in your document, you can expect an inline element to sort of flow and lay out and group together with other inline inline elements. They don't take up the full width of the document or or its container. It's inside. Inline elements will flow in there. A block. Mm -hmm. Boom, creating another container. Big difference. And okay. so like the next level of the big difference, and this is a little bit jumping into probably beyond or whatever, but food for thought, write down, don't worry about it, or you may love this. Each block level element has its own coordinate system inside of it. So it's possible to have your you know, your body of your page around an element that is um, uh, like a div that has its own coordinate system. So if you laid out a div inside a div and you said um, uh, layout is, um, um, all right, is do, 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 do. Let me jump over to this and then the, uh, let's see, toolbar. Uh, alignment. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I cannot believe I'm forgetting this keyword here. Text layout. Um, this is like uh, doo -doo -doo position. There we go. Down there where it says display is where you can change where it's a block or inline, exactly. right? Or is that position? Yeah, so position is, uh, you could say it's relative or it's absolute. So that's the, the word I had stuck in my head is absolute, but no, the, the actual... Um, that's the value, whereas the um, the attribute you're trying to control is called position. So if you're contri trying to control the position on like an anchor tag without turning it into its um, so display, you could do uh, inline inline block, right? And so yeah, there's subtle different layout rules and or different layout rules for these different elements and uh, honestly those I would have to bone up on the difference between inline and inline block um, inline block yeah um, because let's see the the big thing I enjoy taking advantage of is is uh, absolute positioning inside so anything inside toolbar let's see so no toolbar inside another div would then um, here let me draw it on the screen um, <laughs> So you have your document, and we have a div, and then we have a toolbar inside there. So uh -huh. your doc, your document layout is probably it's going to have a oh shoot now I can't switch back and forth between these uh, annotation modes here. 
it's going to be a, a relative, right? In other words, so if I make my browser wider, it's going to center the, 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 the document, the website in, right. inside of my browser. Its position will be relative to whatever the size of my browser is, right? Right. So, and then the toolbar will be relative to the container that it's in. So if, if uh, exactly. it needs to reflow because if I change some elements on there, it's going to reflow. But exactly. then whatever I put as an absolute position inside of that, that toolbar container will never change its position no matter how I reflow everything. Does that make sense? Relative. Is, that, is that right? Yeah, it's because it's funny because we get funky with our uh, phrasings here because relative to its parent container, it's absolute. So it's not. There we go. So you have um, uh, the toolbar could be, let's say it's at uh, uh, left 20 p pixels and it's at top 20 pixels, right? So mm -hmm. that's that's the position of the this, but it's based on the its parent div, which has a relative position to its parent. Right. Yeah. So then, if you then uh, started moving this div around, the toolbar inside is not going to change position relative to its parent. The whole thing's going to move as a group. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of stuff gets uh, funky. But so, but I think it's worth sort of opening the door and kind of pointing through that lies a lot of helpful, powerful, useful stuff. Um, knowing the uh, that the inline and block and the relative and absolute positioning. So, one of the things early on when I first started understanding a little bit of HTML and as I tried to help my other cartoonist buddies get under the hood of it, uh, is I, I had cartoonist friends who started building websites and they came into it from the world of Quark Express and Adobe Illustrator and all of these uh, layout and styling applications where it lets you just say, I want to put this thing here, boom. And you put the thing there and it just stays there, right? And I had to explain to them that, no, HTML is kind of like working in Microsoft Word where each line is above the, the, the next line. And you have to put your containers for your things in that kind of way. You can't just like say, like, I want this to be in the top right corner and just have it just sit there. You have to think about what line of the, of the code is it residing on, and it orders it in such a way. What you're talking about with relative and absolute positioning is it kind of takes us back to the graphic design world of being able to put something in a really specific place on the page and not observe that so, so strictly, that kind of Word document flow of information, right? Does that, does that sound like a fair analogy? It's a really fair analogy. And uh, um, I just want to add to it that in general, though, there's sort of a, you get more control by learning CSS. And you will have um, a lot of consistency. However, it's not like perfect consistency. It's just well, worth pointing out, like you mentioned, the um, a lot of times uh, fellow people dealing with web design, well, we will characterize the print world as having this absolute perfective, perfection control over everything from, from the height, from the width, right? So, and the resolution, like, is this, you know, this is, uh, I don't know, let's say it's, you know, it's eight inches by, you know, seven point, um, seven and a quarter. Two five. Yeah, yeah. Seven point eight. Right, whatever. There you, go. there you go. You can get that precise with it, yeah. You get super precise, and that's how we characterize it. Um, but then we, when we were chatting about this, uh, the show the other day, Jersey, you enlightened me <laughs> that uh, the print world has its flexibilities also. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the, This is something that I think some, I mean, depending on the printer you go with. I mean, if you're going to do like a multi-billion dollar print production, uh, and you go to like the best printer in the entire world, they're going to make some certain guarantees and they're going to stick to those guarantees. But for the most part, I mean, having a background in newspaper production, magazine production, um, there's like a plus or minus 5% of consistency and quality that you get in printing. And I just lived in that world long enough that I'm used to it. And I was working uh, as a contractual graphic designer for a, a museum years ago. And the curator was putting together a brochure for an upcoming exhibition and he was 
he was convinced that if he just used the Pantone matching system, that all of the brochures would look exactly the same. I mean, like you could hold it up under a microscope and this, these. Ink colors would be absolutely consistent because after all, I used the Pantone matching system. Right. And I, I warned him. I said, well, there's going to be a plus or minus factor of 5% depending on the printer because the way printer ink works, they have to, you know, in order to keep the flow of the ink consistent, sometimes they add water depending on what kind of inks they use. So, it's, you know, if you if you spread out 100 of the different uh, pieces that they printed, you're going to notice like a little bit of variation between the different greens that you used. And he said, no, no, that doesn't happen. I said, oh, I'm, I'll just, you know, it's there. And uh, the, the, the brochures came in, and he threw a hissy fit because, like, to your and my eye, we'd look at the greens and go, they're pretty much the same. But to his eye, they were absolutely distinct. This was, like, 2% yellower than this one. And when I said, like, but hold them up as an average and look at them all, they're all pretty much the same. No, I want my money back. You know, so there, there's... um. That's... There's an assumption that that print is precise, but I still think that even print has like a, a little bit of wiggle room when you're cutting books, you know, on a book trimmer. Exactly. There's yeah. going to be a little bit of wiggle room as to oh, oh the margins are like a, a a millimeter different on this batch of books, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess what you're you pointed out something that that I often think of when I'm designing you know any website or system or whatever there there's just trade-offs in the in the real world and there's there's like tolerances that you just have to have for um yeah. variety for change for um slight alteration that um obviously the, you know like there are earlier anecdote talking about uh, if you're making pacemakers or whatnot that's going to be a tight tolerance that's going to be very you know or or you have software running on the space shuttle or whatever right i mean it's right uh, right yeah like the, the backpacks they wore on the moon very tight tolerances there <laughs> not so not so cool we're we're um yeah the the slight difference in in the in anything is is going to be uh, under a lot of scrutiny so which is good yeah but you know what? Um, so as and what's wild is the the print world still sounds like it's it is very um, it's safe to be precise and um, and it has a lot of culture about that precision from what I and from my experience I've not been like in that role as a primary thing ever so um, but then you know that being the case boy the web world is a uh, it's a rather wild and untamed place in by comparison because thousands of combinations of devices and operating systems and browsers and whatever once in a while in the world of electronics like you could have a, a platform like we're are we're making a website that runs on the Wii only the Wii only marketing to Wii folks if other people come out to our site from whatever we'll give them an error and that's it okay you can get fairly close to what it's like in the print world if you get that specific about your platform but if not it, it it's it's pretty wild um it's worth keeping this in mind right because um you 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 may work your tail off to learn you know the right selectors and the and the right um attributes you want to affect you know, all oh, cool. You want to do some rounded corners, and you want to do a little bit of drop shadow, and then all of a sudden you show up on your friend's desktop, and you're like, "Hey, check out my site! I just did all this stuff, and I'm so proud of it." And all of a sudden, some of the things you did don't show up, or they look different. What the heck? Well, I just want to forewarn you that that exists, and is fairly common. Um, yeah, yeah, that was something that was uh, for coming from the print world. It was a hard pill to swallow that. What you mean after I do all this stuff, I have to test it on Internet Explorer. I got to test it on Firefox. I got to test it on Safari. I got to test it on Chrome. I got to test it on Netscape Navigator. What? You know, and because uh, not, not everybody has the exact same configuration, right? And like I have um, a 2001 uh, iBook back when they were called iBooks. And uh, that thing can only be upgraded to, uh, I think the OS on it is 10.3.9. I can't put anything bigger or newer than that on there. And it cannot access the web anymore. Mm. You know, it's like even Gmail. I tried opening Gmail on it and it just said, I don't even know what to do with this. Like, you got to go to the basic <laughs> HTML version of Gmail. Uh, so, 
you know, somebody might be dealing with an older browser. They might be on an older operating system. There's so many variables in there that, like, when I first started getting into designing my own sites, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is, this is torture. It's, yeah, it, it, there is a flexibility which is kind of challenging. But I would say that, for the most part, um, dealing with open standards is a pretty awesome experience. And I, I do want to say that um, part of the complexibility, complexibility, wow, I made up a word. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that went down. Nice portmanteau day. Um, it uh, part of the complexity we face is because of how uh, it's a side effect of openness. And overall, openness is a pretty wonderful thing because when we make websites, it's not like we only can look at websites in certain restaurants or in certain situations in and with one kind of device. Nope, you can do it with thousands anywhere. Good news, bad news. Well, so, and part of why we can do that is because of the openness. And uh, I highly recommend, I mean, you know, okay, if you hit a certain level of, uh, I'm not saying this to brag or whatever, but you know that, like, you care about it enough where somehow it's, like, it's resonating with you a lot. Like, if you're, like, you're getting really into HTML and CSS, um, and you're not sure like if you're really really into it but you are reading the standards on the w3.org site yeah you've crossed that line <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um and what's awesome is it's out there it's not hidden in someone's desk in one company or whatever or on their whatever protected network it's open and what's wild is if you do care about it that much if you do have concerns it's possible to have to to voice those concerns and participate so, food for thought. Um, all right, open standards, yay! Um, <laughs> all right, all right. Well, yeah, we're 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 already at an hour, and I know that uh, Adobe Connect like gets a little touchy when you get too much lo uh, longer than an hour and a half. So, uh, yep, maybe we should jump jump into some Tumblr. We're totally going to jump into it. Um, Tumblr and services like Tumblr Imposterous and Squarespace. Um, they are there. We just looked at tools like Espresso and uh, CSS Edit with Firefox, and you know, just took a peek at it basically via slide. But um, those exist, and you can do that kind of stuff anywhere, and they can help you with Tumblr too. But for that editing part of it, it's all built in to some places like Tumblr, Imposterous, and Squarespace, and there's probably more. I think, yeah, I don't know. There's probably actually come to think of it, WordPress actually has the ability to edit your yep, it theme does live and the website, uh, even if it's an individual installation. So these ideas apply in a lot of places. Um, but yeah, let's let's sort of jump into a, um, a Tumblr site um, and uh, yeah, see what we can see here. Uh, do do. I'm. Opening it up right now. I did a quick search, by the way, on the whole inline block and whatnot. There's certain attributes that do get kind of uh, you get kind of lost in the details of um, all the different versions, how they're treated in different browsers and stuff. That's why some of them, it's like I don't have them all memorized. Um, I keep my reference material available and dive in as needed for those ones that are off my common path. So, uh, okay. Do, 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 do. Um, okay, so here we are in Tumblr. We jumped in to edit a site. I went straight to uh, just slash customize and then my site name for, um, yeah, it's kind of like an art journal blog I was experimenting with during like my, when I was doing 24 hour comic day. Eh, maybe I'll add stuff to it, maybe I won't. Maybe it's time to edit the, um, the style and, uh, you know, freshen it up. So, um, it doesn't, what we see with this is not the, um, uh, we see everything. We've got um, uh, Tumblr and Postris are mighty similar how they behave with, they bake in the HTML and the CSS all together in one sort of mega template that, that can affect your blog in a bunch of ways. So we're not going to delve into the, the 
the the deep magic of how they're doing that. It's it's very cool and it's not magic and um, uh, you can control more than the, just the style basically is what that means. Um, so what we care about is finding the the words CSS or the the phrase CSS. Here we go. We found an embedded style sheet. So up until now we were dealing with linked style sheets. Um, which is commonly what you'll deal with because when they're when they're linked from a separate document the web browser will cache it and not have to download it a lot so the site runs a little faster whereas this time it, it gets this way it gets downloaded every time you download every page um, not the end of the world typically but food for thought so here I'm scrolling down to try to find things that sort of fall outside of um, you know, you see they've got like their special, uh, like these are like Tumblr template commands and stuff. But then inside there we do see like, oh, hey, what well, cool, this is, a, this is a class called short URL. Um, oh, I guess I don't care about short URL, but I recognize what it is. Um, oh, ID of footer. There's an ID of footer info, yeah. Yep. And then some specific things inside footer info. So this is sort of by adding a comma, I actually get to do a sort of like a chained selector. I can select a bunch of stuff and and uh, just tell it all the same thing at once. Cool. So you can learn actually by surfing through other people's style sheets. It's kind of neat. Um, let's see. Page of. I think I want to edit the post. Let's mess with the post. Um, do do do. Here we go. Dot post. Yep. And it looks like there's a box shadow on there. Yep. And then, oh, and then the WebKit box shadow, there's two, isn't there? Because you have to do one for Mozilla, one for WebKit, and then a box shadow for Microsoft Internet Explorer, right? So it's like the same thing, but it's like sort of uh, anticipating different browsers. Is that what that is? Ah, uh, yes. So as browsers evolve, uh, they don't evolve at the same pace. Some of them, you know, it's, it's, uh, some of them, it's exuberance, and, you know, they want to show off their, their new features. Uh, um, some of them do it in a way that, like, um, uh, I need to look into it. It may be more polite for a browser to adopt a new feature by adding a little prefix. I'm not sure. Because um, that's a little more respectful if you're doing it, like, before it's been adopted as a standard, even though it's coming as a standard. I'm guessing, right? So, you know, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, politeness in there, too. Um and also letting you know, like, well, don't expect this to command every browser. But then we notice, well, hey, wait a minute, box shadow. Because I actually, I'm pretty sure if we just, um, if we leave these other two, I'm pretty sure in Chrome, just the plain box, box shadow uh, will work. So we make a change. And unfortunately, it's not all super slick doing it live uh, as we type, like uh, Espresso does. But, uh, but we can click Update Preview. And uh, oh crap, did it do it already? Um, and so, well, we can. He, he, there's a funky thing with um, uh, when you see a, a list of attributes like this. Anything that's using the box model. Here's another. This is a big CSS fundamental concept that um, you know we didn't want this whole podcast to be like front to back CSS fundamentals. That's probably like a a few hour workshop and uh, what yeah. but with the box model and you have so you got an attribute right box shadow mm -hmm. and you got a value this whole darn thing's the value right we're t well, that's a lot of stuff to cram in here so we've got a number space number etc cetera, etc cetera. well what we're doing is uh, any element that's a box we get to talk to it in 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 address sort of the top the right, the bottom, and the left. And that's kind of how it goes. I think it's clockwise. I need to verify that. But, um, yeah, pretty sure. Um, so, and it and there's like shortcuts where if you don't include all four, and there's only three, so I think it's the, um, I think it becomes top and bottom, and then, no, wait, eh, top, because um, we just changed the bottom. Anyway, whatever. Um, it's so... We'll just do the 100 pixels here so we'll know what we're affecting. Okay, so that's bottom. So this is, and then this will be, I don't know, 
80. Left. And then, yeah, so that will be left. I need to scroll. That reloads. I want to uh, change the width of my window here. So, yeah, the 80 pixels, I didn't see where that one went. But, well, here you go. I mean, this is the um, a lot of the what it's like to, oh, it's pro, oh it could be the t post tab. Um, mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah, the second one is definitely the bottom. Yeah. So it must be the top. Yeah, that's what it was. So, or wait, because the top, yeah, because go to the, last post no. well you could easily double check this by copying and pasting it into something like espresso and then look at it with the photoshop uh palette to the site the photoshop ish palette to the site because then yeah. that will show you like yeah the coordinates uh or rather the the top bottom left and right uh values oh there. yeah so you can do um well and the other thing too is we see all right, this is the rgb value right so rgb mm -hmm. plus alpha right so um, you know, uh, red, green, blue value. So we could all to zero. So it's black and right, then a point nine alpha. Like, it's black and we're working on a gray background. So, or, you know, uh, I see. Kind of a dark charcoal. So we could do, um, well, I suppose I turned it more gray, didn't I? <laughs> anyway, uh, um, yeah, you don't want to turn it like two fifty five each that's what, that's make it white. Right. All right. But you get the feel for how we can get in here with our new comfort in playing with CSS, and just by playing and uh, you know learning some of the basics. Okay, so this is the general glow, and because I, it's a tight glow, because all right, now we see it being white there. Uh, if we do that, is 80, and we update. Um, right, it seems to have gone all the way around. Anyway, that's funny. Um, whereas if I do this is zero and then this is a hundred, an update. What? Okay, so we're getting some weird behavior in box shadow. Yeah, it's, now it's just going straight down, bleeding straight down into the next post. Yeah, so I'm guessing that's the bottom then, right? Yep. Um. Oh, it's probably uh, because it's almost 100% uh, opac or um, full. It's it's not it's almost opaque. Yep. And that's why it looks so it looks so solid. All right. So anyway, so that's the bottom. We've got the bottom and the top, and then so this is probably the first number is probably the sides, and then the bottom and the top. And that's the funkiness with when we, again with the box model of if you list all four. You know all four are there, and I think it goes clockwise. Okay. Um, now I really want to look that up to be sure. Uh, do you have any questions while I look that up quick, Jersey? No, you can go ahead and look it up. Uh, and I can just comment that this, what you're doing here is, again, even though you're updating the preview, it's a preview. You're not actually updating it on the site unless you go back to appearance and click the save button. So this is, again, a very safe way to just play with your Tumblr theme. And if you break something, it's not the end of the world. Just don't save your changes. Um, another trick that I've picked up on when making these changes is I'll uh, do a select all and copy this CSS file and drop it into a text editor like Smultron or text edit or, and Rob's going to have uh, resources uh, to share as far as text editors later on that we can put in the show notes. But, uh, I'll, I'll drop it into there and sort of just save it to my desktop as a as a uh, a draft, right? So even if I, let's say I make one, one change too many and uh, it breaks everything and I don't know what I did to break it, I have a draft that I saved just before I made that change that I can copy and paste back in to get to where I was. Sort of like I, I, I create iterative uh, drafts of my CSS file as I'm heuristically trying to figure out how it works so that I save my work, right? But undo's yeah. work is just as well in this situation, I think. Uh, but no, that that's a to bolster uh, your safety with just copying and pasting text to save it is a great idea. 
right? I mean, that, I do that when I, whenever I do like a big change to like a posturous or a Tumblr theme, I will, yeah, I'll manually save this whole thing. I'll just do, you know, select all, copy, and then go straight to a text editor and uh, paste it and then save it as a version and, mm -hmm. yeah, and continue because very helpful. Um, interesting too. Uh, one, another little extra ninja thing. Uh, I, that was correct though, by the way. So if you have all four numbers, right? So if we did, mm -hmm. um, and then, I don't know, 10px here, it goes uh, top, whoops, top, right, bottom, left. So it goes clockwise starting at the top. Gotcha. And, um, yep. Uh, and I was just then surfing through this, and then I noticed important, right? So you have this extra important word, the directive there. Yeah, what does that mean? Um, it's aficionados of CSS can grump about important, but it's I think it's a, a, a necessity. So typically in CSS, it they have this concept of uh, spe uh, I may be messing up the word specificity, right? Where um, if I told a paragraph like to be bold up here and then I said and then I had a pair you know I told paragraph again to not be bold down here um, this one the one on the lower wins right the um, if you have a if you have a linked style sheet and then one that's uh, embedded in the document and they talk up to the same attribute on the same you know via the same selector that that same thing in the DOM is getting affected that same element uh, the last one wins, right? So you have this sort of priority about more specific. Um, it's sometimes it's it's a uh, uh, you can you can lose track as far as where you're at or whatever. And so you're trying to tell the text this they're they're evidently taking this text shadow because I didn't actually do this theme, and they noticed that somehow it wasn't it wasn't happening even though it was all legal and it should work. Because something else was more more specific was overriding it. Well, you can take okay. something and sort of elect it to the top, and by saying important, and of course, gotcha. all bets go off now. If two things are important, and then the one more specific, you know, more specific will win with two importance. But theoretically, not everyone's saying important all the time, right? So, right. if you want to selectively do that to sort of cause your thing to take over I think that's fair and reasonable especially when you're using you know a CMS that's that you didn't you know you don't have that much control over so mm -hmm. there may be a default that tumblr is slipping in that you can't affect you're like oh come on well you can always add exclamation point important at the end of your gotcha yeah good to know that that is one that I did not know uh, so let me just ask you as, as an example how would I take out that uh, Chrome-ish bar at the top of each post where the date is? Like, where would I go? Okay, so header color. Um, honestly, like the the what I would do is grab a visual editor to to tackle that. Like, let's see, we could load uh, Firefox with that, but again, I I prepared that on my other machine, so I think I'm gonna just. You would go there with Firefox plus um, uh, Firebug, turn on Firebug, okay. and then you know turn on the select mode to do this. Or you could go to Espresso and um, copy and paste. Oh, rather no, you just override the CSS and, uh, in the browser in it. Yeah. Yeah. So we would want to open a new preview, and then we'd want to go to um, Tumblr. Okay, I guess it'd be. Um, do 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 persistence layer. Tumblr dot com, and um, then turn on the preview mode here. And we notice, like, okay, I selected something, but it's not that full thing I wanted to select. Well, I may have to click around a little bit more. Oh, okay, cool. There we go. Found it. Date and notes is what it's called. Cool. Um, so what I might do a lot of times, I might prototype playing with it in a tool like um, um, Espresso. Yep. And I do the uh, same thing. 
First time, sometimes I notice a quirk there is like when it first opens that style sheet to override, it may not jump to the right thing. So I may have to click again. Okay, cool, it jumped here. So let's see, the background um, is probably a big part of what's causing that. Like, did you want to... Um, I was just saying as an example, like where you would... I just wanted to get a quick example of how you would troubleshoot something like that. Yeah, that's that? you jump in and find it to start controlling it. And if you want mm -hmm. to shut it off, you can just go display none. Bam. Like, even Gone. there's all this. What's that? Oh, yeah. No, I was just agreeing. Like, wow, simple. Yeah. Uh, and so you can, that's sort of like commenting out uh, a piece of your, your formatting, right? So in, you don't have to delete all that stuff. Leave it in if you want, just in case you might want it later. To put display none, and it just, it leaves all those attributes in there, but now... We don't have to worry about the user seeing it anymore. Right. Let's see. Display. I'm trying to find the different values for... Um, yeah, because I think there there is a... I thought it was hidden. It's not giving me the... There's something funky with the... Uh, my autocomplete. Hmm. Yeah, none... Block box. Okay, so there's not that many options there, but you could also set the um, uh, oh visibility. That's right, visibility uh, hidden. Right. So notice that it's still taking up height in the document, but it's just mm -hmm. hidden. Where display mm -hmm. none, it just booted out of the DOM. Um, cool. Yeah. Anyway, interesting little quirks there. All right. And yeah, I think we should go back to Prezi. Yeah, and like let's let's uh, wrap up with final thoughts on this because I think you gave us a really good start to be, get dig, diving in, digging in, and in a very safe way start to understand this stuff um, a little bit more deeply. This helped me out, and I, I've been playing with CSS for years. So, well, awesome. It uh, it's a deep topic, but you don't have to be. Um, well, I mean, you don't have to be a, a like a decades experienced art professor or um, you know best-selling comic artist to make you know great comics or great art I mean you, you can make great styles and affect your site uh, just by getting in and playing same with uh, same with your art right I mean it's it's a uh, it's just that it, it can really feel weird uh, and and unfamiliar but uh, uh, it's okay to 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 you know explore beyond that um, yeah so the uh, CS, I mean, and, and of course, I mean, that kind of goes without saying or whatever. I'm not trying to just, you know, whatever, give you par parental permission or whatever. It's just, I acknowledge that there's different cultures behind, you know, being a visual artist and being a programmer. But uh, I don't, I think interesting things happen when you kind of mix them a little bit. So, yeah, it's fine. I think so too. Uh, all right. CSS Pocket Guys, Great O'Reilly book. I think if you're going to get one book, and you're like, okay, I'm not too afraid of this CSS stuff. Um, or, or this is, I got some traction. I, I would just joke, go straight for that book. Um, CSS for print designers is cool. I mean, it's more fun. It's more of a, you know, anecdotes and stuff that um, it, it's about, it's a more gradual transition into the CSS world comparatively. Uh, a list apart, awesome blog. If you follow... Um, uh, if you if you subscribe to RSS feeds and whatnot, I highly recommend act, uh, um, a list apart. Smashing Magazine. So a list apart is going to be a mix of hands-on and theory. Smashing Magazine is, uh, I would say it's a it's similar mix of hands-on and theory, but just a little more hands-on. I don't know. That's my okay. gut impression difference. Both great resources. Um, just to you know make you bring interesting things across your radar about CSS, right? that uh, um, you may not have known before. So yeah, CSS radar kind of thing. Um, and then uh, view source. View source on what, you've, you're going to see a, an interesting world beneath the web pages that uh, uh, most sites you, you won't come across much of anything, but once in a while you will find a whole bunch of pros and stories and stuff hidden in the comments of web pages. And then, of course, you're going to find great techniques. If you're like, how in the world did they do X, Y, Z? Like you go to Apple.com and you're looking at their store and they're doing this sweet sliding banner thing. View source. 
jump in, see what yep. it's like. Yep. So cool. Um, that's how I, that's how I learned. I mean, uh, I got I went to webmonkey.com when I was first starting out and reading a bunch of HTML tutorials, learning how to make things red, how to make links different colors. And then I got some HTML books, and it just seemed kind of impenetrable to me at first. So then I took Adobe Go Live, which was a WYSIWYG editor at the time, and I just copied the source out of a bunch of different sites that I liked. And I was like, this site looks cool. I wonder what they did. And then I pasted the source into the, the WYSIWYG editor and then looked at it in design mode. And I could say, oh, when I click on this and I go back into tech, the source mode, it highlights what I'm looking at. That was a way for me to translate the visual aspects into the, the HTML aspects. That was a way to sort of training wheels my uh, exploration of HTML. So that is awesome. I actually I wasn't I wasn't quite into the a, a bigger Adobe suite at that point. So I never had Go Live, um, but sounds like it was a cool I, app. It is basically just like Adobe's version of Dreamweaver before they bought Dreamweaver. So I still have Go Live for uh, Adobe CS one, and it's it's. Pretty similar, a little bit more Adobe-ish than I than I would say Dreamweaver is, but uh, sure. Anyway, um, so, so uh, yeah, that was it. That's what we had on CSS today. Awesome. That was super cool, Rob. That that was that was a good refresher course for me, and, it, and like I said, I learned a couple new things that it's going to make it easier to do some of the sugary cereals. Uh, modifications that I want to do, and that, that, I mean that's the, another closing thought is that this is. One of your uh, banners that you like to wave is iterate. Oh yeah, you know? just get in there and make first, and then build and iterate later. You know, revise your site and constantly learn new things and add those new things. You don't have to start out of the gate with like the most beautiful uh, CSS implementation in the entire world, right? You know what? If you want something safe to play with, go uh, try to make your links look more like how you want links look to look on your on your site. So. You want to look for the, uh, you know, the the A tag, right? Yep. Dot A. Yep. Um, or just no, just A, because that's a type. Oh, oh. So, yep. So it'd be A, and then there's A hover, A clicked, I yep. think. Uh, yeah, A visited. Yep. A visited. That's what it is. And there's yeah. uh, yeah, then. Yeah, uh, right. So yeah, one more ninja thing as far as selectors. Um, we have uh, do 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 do. I'm trying to remember the titles. The the. the uh, oh right, they are. Sorry, I should remember the pseudo classes. So yeah, you have uh, a link, a visited, a hover, a focus, a active. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then yeah, so there's a variety of those those kind of things, and so between. You know, searching as far as uh, what can you affect in the CSS, uh, looking at source, and then starting to play with it just on your site. Like, just focusing on the on the links could give you like a good breadth of um, first exposure on it, as a suggestion, right? And it's yeah. really safe. It's not like you're going to uh, end your site by playing with the style of your anchor tags, right? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> You'll only be mortally wounded somewhat. Yeah. So don't worry about it. If you try hard enough, I bet you could do it too. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, I, I I take that back. I have killed some sites using non web safe colors. Oh. Uh I I I broke a site once because I was using a color that for whatever, for whatever reason the browser that I was using hated and it said I'm not displaying the site anymore. And that was the only thing I changed was I I was in Adobe Photoshop, I grabbed the uh the web value of the color and it was some color of blue, some really weird color of blue. Sure. And I dropped it in and it said I hate that color, I'm not doing it. So, uh that was one instance where doing that actually broke my site for momentarily or at least in that browser. So, right. So yeah, you're mentioning like like the the web is probably uh, the hexadex hexadecimal version of the color. Yep. Yeah, six digit, and it's like what is it like base? I forget what base uh, numbering six. system they use. Was it? It's uh yeah hex is uh what six right? So it's um it's what a through f and what zero through nine, right? Yeah. Anyway. Um, I always 
do you know conversions and use utilities whatever but anyway um, that's typically the color kind of um, what you're pasting in is is hexadecimal mm -hmm. uh, unless like we ran into RGBA right so then that's RGB right. plus alpha so yeah anyway but uh, that's funny was that an older browser I assume yeah, this was years ago this was like back in like 2006 so wow yeah that old All right. technology well, thank you for this awesome, awesome presentation, Rob. This was super, super cool, and I hope that this expands out into a class that we can offer later on, because I think that, yeah, you're right, this could easily be like a four- to five-hour class. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm puzzling out um, what to do as far as like an HTML crash course before the game development uh, workshop that I'm working on. Because... Cool. Yeah. So work in progress, uh, and yeah, if anyone has questions or feedback or requests for that, we'd love to hear it too leanintoart at gmail.com and leanintoart.com is the site lean into art on twitter you're going to hear all this in the closing music if you stick around for that so uh, awesome. but anyway any, uh, thank you rob and thanks everybody for oh uh, you've had awesome questions this has been great you're clearly a uh, uh, a veteran of of the web so thank you I, i've been in a skirmish or two yeah. uh so Okay, well, thanks, everybody, for listening and downloading. Uh, if you thought this stuff was useful and helpful and you don't want to send us an email, a great thing you could do uh, is you go to iTunes and give us a star review. That helps other people find this stuff. If you think it's useful, if you think other people would benefit from this stuff, that's one of the best ways to give us a little bit of a pat in the back. So uh, the, the world at large will be, be that much more aware of us. So, uh, okay. Thanks, everybody, for uh, sticking around for this thing. And uh, until next time, next week, which will be an audio-only episode... I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I have been 